Hi everyone, uh, my name is Anna Albinson and I am CMO at Biznode. Uh, I'm happy to be here to share some thoughts about how you can work with data to do better and more efficient sales and marketing. Uh, I've also invited uh, Mats Lindgren, who is CEO of Code Future, and he will also share a study that we have done together uh, where we have interviewed 300 CEOs around Europe on how to become a more data-driven company. But uh, let's start with uh, some uh, insights on uh, how to work with sales and marketing in a data-driven way. Things are moving really, really fast in the digital world. Uh, the human brain works uh, the same today as it did 10,000 years ago. But someone told me that we have as many impressions in one day today as someone lived in the Stone Age had for a full lifetime of period. But it's actually not the number of impressions that is the biggest challenge for the human brain. It's uh, things going on at the same time, parallel impressions. It's like when you try to drive your car and talking the phone at the same time or answering a few emails and talking to someone uh, in parallel. That is difficult for the human brain. But what's happening within data and digitalization right now is that we have exponential growth and with exponential growth, we mean that first there is nothing and then there is nothing again. And then maybe there is just a small piece and then everything comes at the same time. It's almost like the uh, ketchup effect. And the same thing is happening uh, with data. This is the time it took to hit 50 million users. For the airlines, it took 68 years. And for Pokemon Go, it took 19 days. There is, of course, a, a huge difference between physical goods and digital goods. Physical goods needs to be produced, distributed and market out in the markets, while uh, digital goods could be shared through networks to an extra cost of almost zero. So it's a big difference between the physical goods and the digital goods, of course. And the same thing is happening with data that is seen to be one of the world's most valuable resource of our time. And 90% of all data has been added in the last two years. And last year, 90% of all data had been added in the last two years as well, which means that we have exponential growth within data. Data, the access to data uh, is growing enormously. Uh, but my experience is that it's not uh, access to data that is the biggest challenge for companies today. I would say that the biggest challenge is to be able to structure, organize and get the smart insights out of the data. I'm sure that you have um, data in many different systems in your company. You probably have a CRM system, uh, an ERP system, maybe you have a marketing automation platform. And it's a difficult and a big challenge to get all that data together to be able to bring out the diamonds and the insights out of that data. And if you then put it the other way around, you could say that if you have a really valuable resource in your company, it's renewable, you can use it over and over again. But if you're not in control of your data and if you don't use that resource, you have a data waste uh, within your organization. And if there is only one thing that I would like you to remember uh, today, uh, it's the truth about data. And that is uh, that good decisions made on bad data are just bad decisions that you don't know about yet. And that is the principle of shit in and shit out. You need to be in control of your data before you can do the really cool stuff and get the really valuable diamonds out of your data driven world. So Please remember, shit in, shit out. And this is the number uh, of outdated data in an average company's CRM system. So 40% of the data is in general outdated. And if you're going to start your data-driven work 
based on this data, you will uh, get into problems because the actions and the insights that you get out of your data-driven work will uh, point you in the wrong direction. So the first thing you have to do when you want to work data-driven is to really be in control of your own data. But when you are in control of your own data, that's when you can start to bring out the diamonds and to really uh, get the value out of your data-driven work. And one thing that you can do uh, when you are in control of your data is to work with predictive analytics. And it's very useful both for sales and for marketing. And when we talk about predictive analytics, we want to go from what happened in the past to what will happen in the future. So we will use historical data to make future predictions. So it's almost like a um, high tech crystal ball to look into where you understand how your customers will behave in the future. The first thing you need to think about if you want to work with predictive analytics when you are in control of your own data is that you need to define your own business challenge. What do you want to know? What do you want to find out in your high tech crystal ball? This is just a few examples from our customers, things that you might find out with uh, predictive analytics, like uh, who is the market for who is in the market for a new sofa, who is moving house, uh, which companies will be hiring next year and so on. Uh, but as I said, this is just a few examples. Uh, the first thing you need to do is to find out your business challenge. If you could look into the high tech crystal ball, what would you uh, like to find out that will bring a lot of value into your company? But when you know that, it's actually not that hard to work with predictive analytics. It might sound complicated, but I would say it's not. You need to be. You need to work in three different areas when you uh, do predictive analytics. The first thing is that you need to be in control of your customer data. That's what I've been talking about before. The principle of shit in and shit out. You need to know enough about your customers, and you need to make sure that the data you have about your customer is correct. So that's the first step. Then you need to add some transactional data. And with transactional data, I mean that we need to understand how your customers has behaved in the past. What uh, did they buy before? What kind of products? When do they buy from you? And so on. So we need to understand how your customer has behaved in the past in your company. And then you add some analytical variables. That is often something that you don't have within your own company. It's something that you need to a data analytics company to provide for you. But if you are in control of your customer data and you can share some transactional data, we can do uh, predictive analytics together when you have found out what you want to know about your customers in the future. So we uh, have asked 300 C-levels around Europe uh, what they see as the biggest challenges in becoming a more data-driven company in general. And when we ask that question, we get a pretty clear answer. Um, and the biggest challenge for companies today is data. So it's to be in control of your data and to have enough data and structured data within your company. So that's the biggest challenge uh, today for um, uh, leaders around Europe uh, when they work in, in becoming a more data-driven company. But as you see, uh, two to five uh, is employees, change, people and management. So to become a more data driven organization is also a lot about leadership and people management and so on. So it's not only the hard stuff that you need to be in control of, you also need to be in control of the culture within your company and the people working there. So they work together with you in becoming a more data driven company. We actually ask them uh, what annoys them uh, the most at work? Is it people or tech? And it's actually almost 50-50. And this also indicates that a lot of companies struggle uh, not only with tech and data, and they also struggle 
with the, uh, how how to lead the people uh, through a data driven transformation journey within the company. So it's very, very important to not only focus on tech and data, but to also bring on the people uh, on this journey. But one thing that is very, very clear is that there is a huge potential for those companies that are able to work with data and become uh, a data-driven company for real. And the leaders around Europe agrees on that in 2030, winning on our market will be about using data better than anyone else. And that is uh, applicable in uh, almost all industries and on different kind of levels. So there is a huge potential for those companies that uh, are successful in the data-driven transformation. All right, so to sum up, uh, here comes my top three tips on how to gain a data advantage with predictive analytics and to work in a more data-driven way. And the first thing is that you need to define your business challenge. What do you want to know about your customers? What do you want to see in the high tech crystal ball in the future? Secondly, make sure that you have the right data and know enough about your customers. That's the principle of shit in, shit out. Thirdly, that you need to promise yourself to act on the insights that you get out of your data. And that is where a lot of companies actually struggles. Because when you work in a data driven way, you will get the diamonds and you will get the insights that can really change uh, your company and make it grow and work, it, work in a more efficient way. But if you are not able to act on the insights, you will do all that work for nothing. So when you work within marketing and sales and you really find out who will be interested in your products in the future, then you need to be able to work in a way so that you can uh, really unleash the power of that insight. Probably you need to change the way that uh, your sales force works. They need to work on different accounts. They maybe need to uh, work on other parts of your offerings and so on. But you need to make the changes according to the insights to get um, the full uh, value of your investments. So before you start your data driven work, promise yourself that those insights we will get out of this investment, we will make sure that they will um, happen uh, and we will act on them to, to get the full value. So that's my top three tips if you want to come, become a more data-driven company and work with predictive uh, analytics. Uh, and as I introduced now, uh, we have done this survey uh, with uh, where we have interviewed 300 C-levels around Europe uh, about uh, how to become a more data-driven company. And to do that survey, we work together with Kairos Future. So uh, Mats Lindgren has promised to give you some more details and insights about uh, this uh, these interviews. So I hand over to you now, Mats. Thank you very much. And I'll try to share my screen then and to also present the results. So um, uh, we summarized everything in seven steps to a data-driven organization. And I go through, not all, through all the steps, but at least give an introduction for you. Um, and then you can download the full report at this node's website, if you're interested in all the details. But just a few uh, words about myself then. Uh, since more than 25 years, I'm running a company, a foresight and strategic innovation con consultancy, where we try to assist our clients in sort of spotting the future before the competitors do and act upon it. But during that journey, we've also realized how important it is to work with the data. So actually as a spin out from the company now, we have a, an end-to-end -end text analytics SaaS platform that where you can work with exactly what Anna talked about, but also with unstructured data such as text. But I'm not going to talk about that now, but I'll be talking about uh, 
the results from the report. So what is the status in uh, European business now in terms of data maturity and data uh, orientation? Um, well, the, we have a number, asked actually a number of questions. And one of the questions was, of course, how mature are companies? And what is the way to mature, the, the road to maturity? And the results basically were summarized in a five-step model where we can find on, on the left side here with the laggards, like 16% of the companies in 10 countries across Europe. And on the other side, the more data-driven companies probably five years from now or 10 years from now, we wouldn't consider them being data driven, but more maybe strategic or structured, but today they are really more data driven. Question number one, does sort of, does it pay off to be data driven? And to find the answer to that, we actually asked nine different performance questions to the, to, to the respondents and asked them to rate themselves compared to their peers in their own industry. And that's quite a normal way uh, working with uh, management uh, research and this, this kind of management research. And the thing is that if we look at uh, companies on the lower side, on the laggard side, <clears throat> that have not implemented that many uh, sort of data practices in their business, uh, only 2% consider them uh, high performers, whereas 47% of the more sort of mature companies consider themselves high performers compared to their peers. So it's a huge difference between the, uh, the data-driven and the less, very less, less data-driven companies. So how do you move from, from being laggard or curious up to a strategic or, or data driven then? There are a number of barriers and, and Anna talked about one of them, that's basically data. But there are other barriers and the one at the bottom in, in her presentation was management. But management actually came up or top leadership came up as spontaneous comments from, from several of the respondents to get the understanding from leadership of the need for data, for instance. And when we look at sort of the maturity of the top management, we see that only about one third of the top management teams in the companies interviewed um, have some kind of basic, a majority of the top management have some kind of basic understanding of, of uh, concept data related concepts such as being able to explain differences between machine learning and neural networks. Maybe that's a little bit tricky, but have a clear understanding of how automation can improve your operations. Only 38% said that, okay, half of the top management understands that. And also among the, uh, also among the uh, interviewees, one fourth actually said that I think it's too much talk about data and AI. So there is some kind of resistance, obviously, also among top management in, in many companies uh, across Europe. But the question then is, does this sort of data maturity among executives matter in terms of companies becoming more data mature in general and also being more high performing? Well, it seems like it matters a lot. It, on the left-hand side, you have companies with low managerial knowledge. On the right-hand side, you have the high managerial knowledge companies. And you can see the curves. They go from quite straight, straight upwards. And in fact, actually, if we look at sort of the, being, the percentage of high performers, only 9% in the bottom and 54% in the top. So it's really, really a big difference uh, and it has a huge impact both on the maturity in terms of applying different ways of working with data in the organization and also on the performance of the organizations. Another sort of challenge that also appeared on, on our slide before is the cultural aspect. And that the question is, okay, what does a successful culture look like when it comes to, to becoming more data um, agile or data and mature. <clears throat> to find out, we took a model that was presented in HBR, Harvard Business Review, in two years ago, um, and applied that in, in the research. And they identified eight general cultures in, in uh, 
that companies can have. And the question, of course, is what does a winning data culture look like? What kind of sort of cultural um, characteristics are the most characteristic cultures in that kind of organizations? And not so surprisingly, it's really a learning culture and also results-oriented culture. Whereas on the other side, sort of the looser cultures seems to be the, quite the opposite. It's the security-oriented organizations and the caring, the, the cozy, the caring-oriented organizations that are not that alert and not that sort of um, fast to move into some a more data-driven approach. So one conclusion from that would be, could be, be that we need actually to get rid of, of the compliance cultures that now seems to reign so many organizations across Europe and other parts of the world as well. We are so afraid of doing, not complying to all the uh, rules and regulations that we're supposed to apply to, uh, comply to. Um, third question then is, where should we put the money? If we start investing in being more data oriented and data driven, where should we put the money? Is it in more money into the IT department, support functions? Should we datify marketing, R&D, sales, purchasing, logistics, production, customer support? Where should we put the money? So we looked, asked the companies actually, or, or the respondents, where do you put your money? Where do you plan to put your money now? <clears throat> and then we looked into, okay, sort of based on where they put the money now, how do they perform? And if we look at that kind of map, we can see that on the hand side, that's basically where we put the money today, and that's basically in IT. And But it doesn't matter that much because what, what's in the top is what matters, seems to matter most in terms of organizational performance. So we seem to be very much... Um, over-investing now in IT-related um, uh, aspects, whereas we should invest much more in, in marketing, sales, and R&D-related data projects. So finally then, seven steps to uh, becoming a more data-driven organization, and that's also in the report. First of all, it's now it's happening. It's not the future. Data is not the future. It's data is basically the present. And you need to start experiment and try out new models to work with data and to gain um, in new insights and, and high performance based on what you, the data you actually have. Um, the second one is that executives and management in general should take and must take the lead. Uh, if not, nothing will happen. We need to identify the, the pockets of resistance and beat the resistance and promote a learning and achieving or sort of results-oriented culture. Attracting talent, and I mentioned that also, that is also extremely important, being um, an attractive employer, and that seems to be much, much more important for the more mature companies. In the beginning, it's very much data. In the end, it's very much when you are already mature and you are maturing, you have a big problem in, with attracting all the talent you basically need to do the projects you are intending to do. We also need to shift perspective away from investing everything into IT with this is an IT issue into focusing on what seems to matter most is marketing and sales, sort of marketing side and also the R&D development side that seems to matter. And finally, this is not a one shot, it's, it's a continuous improvement process and the when you started walking, you need to continue walking because each step we take on the road to data maturity widens the horizon and opportunities to continue moving forward. So uh, thank you and good luck. I think you'll need it. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Mats. We are now working on another project together uh, where we uh, actually uh, make interviews, more deep interviews with uh, companies that have really been successful in becoming more uh, data driven. That uh, report will be launched in some time in September. But I know that now in times of Corona, I know that we talked to these companies about how uh, Corona has impacted data and analytics investments. Can you just say a few words about the results of that? Yeah, the, the, ver the very short summary is that um, for some companies, of course, it's been a financial restraints now, and the companies that are really hard hit, hardly hit on by the COVID-19, but they are quite few. So the general picture is that either um, it's in sort of accelerated the digitalization in general that they already are into. And for the more mature company, it's been very much a confirmation of what they're already doing and also a confirmation that we need to find new types of data and work even harder to integrate the data approach into the companies. So it's more accelerating the data orientation than, than uh, sort of the, sort of the opposite. Yeah, and if we think that digitalization were moving fast before Corona, I think the the high we have even higher speed uh, right now uh, within digitalization within society. So it will be very interesting uh, to to see the full report, and uh, we will sh uh, share it on our website from I think it's mid or end of September. So. Just something coming up. Uh, so thank you all for having us uh, and uh, goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.